Senator Joni Ernst, happy caucus day. Thank, Thank you, you so much for joining us here in studio. You obviously have not endorsed a candidate in this race. You maintain that you will not. You're going to let Iowans make their choice. But can you say you have equal confidence in each of these candidates that they have the ability to beat Joe Biden? in a general election. I, Are they all the same on that front? I do, I think to, to varying degrees, um, but what we'll do here in Iowa is winnow down that field. And uh, of course they'll go on to New Hampshire after uh, we finish tonight. But I do think we've got incredible candidates that are out there. And if you look at Joe Biden's approval rating, lowest ever, uh, I even hear Democrats out there that are asking us about the Republican candidates because they just don't want to see a Joe Biden second term. I'm curious about your approach here. If you're not endorsing, you have said some interesting things, though. You said that Nikki Haley is a great candidate. We saw you introduce her as well as Ron DeSantis mm -hmm. uh, recently. Uh, you said you've already made up your mind as well yes. and that you're not going to let me inside your head here. <laughs> you've also said it's not a foregone conclusion, though, that Donald Trump will win. Why not use your influence and help be a decision maker here when it comes to this caucus? A lot of people have asked that over the course of many caucuses now. Um, but again, we have the great honor and privilege as Iowans of hosting the first in the nation event. Uh, so I take that matter very seriously. And I think it's incredibly important that Iowans are able to make up their own mm -hmm. minds without undue influence. Senator Chuck Grassley and I have maintained this now yeah. for several caucuses. Uh, so again, honoring our Iowa voters and allowing them to make a choice. At the same time too, if we endorse too early, it could discourage candidates from coming out and meeting Iowans. Mm -hmm. And again, I think it's incredibly important that all of these great candidates have the opportunity to showcase their abilities, their knowledge about the issues that matter to Iowans. I don't want to discourage that. So if it's about honoring the choice of each individual I Iowan, will you commit to endorsing whoever it is they choose, whoever they place first in this race? I think it's incredibly important that we do not see President Joe Biden in the White House. And so I anticipate as we move through the nomination cycle, that we have a great candidate, and then I will work very hard to make sure that Joe Biden is not in the White House. Well, we'd love the insider's view here as we all prepare to watch this uh, unfold tonight. The local view on what to watch. We're told that this race, at least the race for second, will be decided in the suburbs. Is that true? And what counties and communities are you watching tonight? Well, I do think the suburbs really do matter um, in this contest. I think they're incredibly important. And the message that will resonate with um, those PTA moms, um, even working moms that are out there, I think it is uh, important that we reach out to those voters. We saw a lot of those voters that have uh, gone more to the left. And so we want to bring them back into the fold. But also in our rural areas, uh, the areas that I am from, you know, who is that candidate that will reach out, touch that ag community, those farmers, make sure they understand that liquid fuels are still viable in the future. Uh, we are very strong in ethanol and biofuels here in the state of Iowa. Yeah. Very important issue for us. Well, we're told that the rural areas are Trump country. Is that right? Trump was really good on ethanol. I'm go I I'll just say that. Spent a lot of time in the Oval Office with President Trump, just explaining the dynamics of biofuels and why it's so important. Um, but here we have President Joe Biden that is pushing electric vehicles. It's almost a mandate on the manufacturers, on consumers. Uh, you will buy an electric vehicle, even though large in part, those batteries are manufactured by our number one adversary, China. Um, so we want people to understand that this is an issue. President Trump was very good on that issue. Joe Biden, not so great on that issue. So for rural voters, they remember the Trump years and they remember how well they did uh, when he was president. Do you have any qualms whatsoever about the idea of a second Trump presidency, especially knowing the great geopolitical challenges the U.S. is facing on many fronts and his more isolationist bent, the idea that perhaps he could pull out of NATO when there is actually conflict right on the brink of NATO countries? Well, that's where I think that uh, as members of Congress, we should have 
great influence on whoever that next president is and making sure they understand how it how important it is that we maintain our friendships around the world and i believe in america first as well but never america alone we have got great friends and allies all around this globe we should be supporting our friends and allies because they are doing a lion's share of the work on their own. Um, so I do believe in uh, supporting globally where it makes sense. That doesn't mean engaging our young men and women all the time in military action. No, it means we should be working with partners and leveraging the soft power that we have around the globe. But that, mean, that means we have to maintain friendships. Mm -hmm. So I would encourage President Trump, if he goes into a second presidency, he needs to maintain those friendships. And you have confidence that he would make that I think, decision? I think so, as long as we're educating him on the dynamics um, between those countries, I think it's incredibly important. We also have a number of other candidates out there that maybe don't understand that dynamic. Um, that's why I tend to gravitate and, and speak highly about Nikki Haley's foreign policy. She has stood in that position where she has to push very aggressively against authoritarian regimes, mm -hmm. as she did as a, an ambassador to the United Nations. Um, but she also understands that we need to be uh, working with partners as well. You're heading back to Washington after the caucus to deal with some pretty important stuff, trying to avoid a government shutdown that would begin on Friday and also somehow manage this border deal that's been in the works in your chamber. We're hearing from House Republicans that it's dead on arrival, that the work that Jim Langford and his colleagues have done does not meet the grade. Are you getting frustrated with the reaction from next door? Well, I am frustrated with outside organizations that before a bill is even written, say, don't support it. Uh, because I do think that Senator James Langford, he is an incredibly serious legislator. He is also a very conservative legislator. So as I have looked through the proposal, as I have actually asked James those questions, he is very serious about this. And his proposal is a serious proposal. So when he brings it in front of our conference, as he's discussing it with our House members, I hope they keep an open mind and make up their own mind. What I would remind, just as I did the members of my own conference in the Senate, is that take a look at all of those wonderful border and immigration bills that we passed during the Trump administration. Remember all of those great bills, you know, the ones that we had when Donald Trump was in the White House, when we had the majority in the House and the Senate, and a member of our conference said, we didn't have any. Uh, and I said, yeah, which exactly, bills those? Okay. <laughs> exactly. This is an incredible opportunity that James Langford is working on that we can present to the yeah. American people to actually do something and force the Democrats to accept. Doesn't that mean you have to act though before a potential Trump presidency? Is that not what you're saying? Yes, and I think it needs to be like right now because okay. on day one, whether it is a Donald Trump presidency, a Nikki Haley presidency, a Ron DeSantis, I don't care. Whoever we have in the White House come next January, they will have the tools necessary on day one to have much better border protection and policy than we do today. Uh, this is a disaster on our southern border. This is the number two issue with Iowa voters. Economy is first, border is second. We've got to do something. Well, and of course, Republicans in both the Senate and the House are using the border as leverage now to get funding for Ukraine as part of this emergency supplemental package. If a deal is made and you've got what you want on the border, is this the last chance Ukraine has to get U.S. funding? Because what are you going to be able to actually get that to pass after yeah, this I, round? I do think that this is important. Um, but on the issue of Ukraine as well, I do support Ukraine. I think it is important that we push back on Vladimir Putin. Uh, he has invaded a country. He has ignored their borders, just as we see other nations ignoring our southern border. Um, we need to push back on that before we have to involve young American soldiers, Marines, airmen, and so forth. We're not at that point, but let me tell you, if they go through Ukraine, they go into NATO countries, we will be involved. I don't wanna see that happen. I believe in weapons for Ukraine. I don't believe in welfare for Ukraine. And I think this is where we can balance it. 
we can scale back on the amount of giving that we do for Ukraine and the amount of the humanitarian assistance. Our European partners, again, leveraging partnerships, our European partners can really ante up much more than they have when it comes to humanitarian dollars or assistance going into Ukraine. We are the arsenal of democracy in the United States. We can produce weapons. We can produce munitions. I think that is what we can do for the Ukrainian people. Hard to produce munitions with the supply chain, manufacturing chain challenges that we have in the defense industrial base. Isn't that part of the point of that bill? Not just it funding is. Ukraine, but shoring up our ability to replenish our own stocks here. Yeah, absolutely. We need to strengthen our defense industrial base. We have known this for years, even before the Russia-Ukraine debacle that we see right now. We have known that, and yet we have ignored it through various presidencies. Phenomenal opportunity to really build up our base mm -hmm. and make sure that we are doing this by leveraging American jobs. Um, and that's incredibly important. We have the technology, we have the ability and skills here in the United States to really build up the defense industrial base, produce our own munitions and weapons. That always comes first, but then get rid of all the old stuff and mm. ship it to Ukraine. Mm -hmm. And finally, just in the last 24 hours, we've come to understand there is a deal on a continuing resolution, once again laddered, to keep funding the government <laughs> to two dates in early March. Is that adequate time when nothing yet has proved enough time to reconcile what the House of Representatives and this Senate wants? Are I, we going to see this appro appropriations process finished by yeah, March? I can't believe we are in this position because all of the appropriations bills have passed through the Senate Appropriations Committee on a bipartisan basis, Republicans and Democrats supporting, and yet Chuck Schumer will not move any of these bills on the floor of the Senate. This is outrageous. Uh, we have had all of this time since before the Christmas break to get appropriations bills done. But what did Chuck Schumer do? Again, bills are waiting to be taken up on the floor of the Senate. He did nothing, absolutely nothing. So here we are once again looking at a continuing resolution. Mm -hmm. So what I would ask of our leadership, get the bills across the floor. We're ready to vote on them. Bring them up. It's hard to, hard to vote on them when Chuck Schumer won't move on them.